Yeah. All right, I'm gonna start letting everyone in. Um, Alexa, I need to share my screen and it's disabled for me for some reason. Hello and welcome to the first session of the 2021 Invis Virtual Conference Series. I'm Catherine DeVries, co-president of the Invis Trainee Board. In this conference series, we're pleased to present to you our carefully selected speakers from our 2020 physical conference, which sadly we had to cancel completely. But I'm pleased to tell you we'll be back in person next summer at our conference, which is scheduled for July 21st through the 23rd. 2022 in Montreal, Canada. We'll continue our virtual conference series next week, Wednesday, June 23rd at 11 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. And please check the Invis website for the complete virtual conference series information. Today, we're pleased to begin our conference series with the Kurt Fisher Memorial Symposium. Kurt Fisher was the founding president of Invis and the founding editor of the Mind, Brain, and Education Journal. Today's presentation was put together by our past president, Mary Helen and Mordino Yang. Mary Helen is a professor of education, psychology, and neuroscience at University of Southern California and director of the USC Center for Affective Neuroscience Development, Learning, and Education. And she's going to tell us about today's panelists. Mary Helen. Thank you, Kat. Um, welcome, everyone. It's it's such a pleasure to finally be able to hold this symposium um, after it's uh, had to have been canceled several times um, in memory of my graduate advisor, Kurt Fisher, who's launched the society and was a major uh, major force in the, in the launching of the field. Um, I'm I'm going to jump right in with the content because we've got a lot of uh, amazing uh, people here today, um, and I really am, am excited for us all to engage in a conversation together. Um, I think that in terms of administrative details, if you have uh, questions, you should ask them in the uh, in the chat as it's going, and Kat and Alexa will be um, filtering those and asking them on your behalf for the most part, just to be efficient. Um, so I'm gonna launch straight into the content. You know who the speakers are because uh, the bios and things are, are posted on the Invis website. So I'm not gonna spend time on that. Um, I'm Mary Helen and Mordino Yang, as you heard. I'm a, an affective social uh, neuroscientist and also a developmental psychologist. And I also do a lot of work with schools and education. Um, and uh, I'm gonna pass it right away to uh, my colleague Solange de Nervaux. Uh, who can quickly introduce herself. Um, and then I'm gonna ask uh, each of the uh, expert educators on the panel to introduce themselves for a few minutes to talk for uh, a couple of minutes about the work that you do so that we have a sense of your perspective and what you bring to the conversation. And then I'm gonna um, ask uh, uh, Dr. Eva Kelser to uh, introduce herself and launch straight into her, into her talk. Um, so uh, Solange, do you wanna quickly introduce yourself? Okay, why don't we just, uh, she may be having some technical issues. Why don't we, why don't we move uh, to Jeff, Jeff Garrett, do you want to start? Yeah, otherwise I'm- Oh, I you are here, okay, great. Yeah, I have <laughs> the notes. This is the it of Zoom, right? Go ahead, Solange. Yeah, so I'm Solange Denevel and I'm from Switzerland. I'm a former Montessori teacher and then I turned into science. I have a bioengineering background and I did an PhD in neuroscience about Montessori education. Yeah. And I'm very happy to be here today with all of you. Jeff, go ahead. You can, you can talk for a few minutes, Jeff. Okay, well, good morning, everyone, um, or 
Good afternoon, wherever you may be uh, around the world. Uh, pleasure to be here today. I'm Jeffrey Garrett. Um, my current uh, role is I'm the Senior Vice President of Leadership Development um, at an organization called the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools, uh, which is a nonprofit that manages 19 schools uh, within the Los Angeles Unified School District here in Southern California, um, and specifically working with uh, schools and communities that have been some of the, the most historically underserved uh, parts of our city. And uh, before I uh, moved to LA to take this role, I spent uh, about a decade working in New York City. Um, I was a principal of a public secondary school uh, serving grades six to 12 in the South Bronx. Um, I uh, was previously a high school social studies teacher um, teaching world history and the US government and uh, began my career as a, as a college admissions officer. Um, part of what brings me here today is I've also had the really good fortune uh, of working with um, Mary Helen uh, on uh, a pretty fascinating study looking at um, what is happening in classrooms where deeper learning is taking place, um, both uh, observationally between teachers and students and also uh, inside the the brains of educators who are doing really exciting things in the classroom. So um, it is, as I said, a pleasure to be here. And uh, Mary Helen, do you want me to just pick someone to go next or will you pass the mic? Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be Aaron next. Go ahead, Aaron. Fantastic. Good morning, everyone. My name is Aaron Whalen. I am the principal and starting July will be the executive director of a school called Da Vinci Rise High School. Uh, our high school is designed around the needs of youth experiencing foster care, uh, transiency, so youth who are in and out of homelessness, as well as justice involved youth. So a lot of students who are on probation or have been at camp. And so really centering the needs of those students uh, in Los Angeles took a few things. Um, one was just a, a larger kind of uh, conversation with youth who are in these predicaments who have been born into this situation to figure out what is school doing and or not doing uh, to meet the needs of, of you as you try to traverse this really challenging point in your life. And so some of the things that we've gotten to are flexible scheduling, that allows students to uh, take in their other priorities, whether that is being a parent themselves or meetings with their PO or their attorney, all into their day-to-day -day schedule for many of our youth when they move foster homes or when they're in uh, the justice involved kind of circumstances, those things take them out of the school and thus the school punishes them for systems that for which they can't control. Additionally, we have a full mental health team on our staff in-house, and so we have a school psychologist, counselors, social workers, all partnering with our teachers and our staff to best meet the needs of those youth. Uh, in addition, we co-locate with nonprofit uh, profit organizations that uh, provide those wraparound services. So, so looking at kind of nutrition, but also dance and art uh, and additional counseling services. A lot of our students really do need a one-to-one -one support system in that way. And so co-locating with nonprofit organizations allows us to provide those services to youth, even within some of the confines of California and uh, our, our per capita funding. Uh, and so having that co-location allows us to still afford the youth that that uh, really personalized wraparound service model. In addition, um, given the trauma that our students have faced, we do a lot of different assessments upon intake. So we do the adverse childhood experiences assessment, which gives us a barometer kind of of where our youth are, what might be most needed. All of our staff are trauma informed. And so they look at like proximity, volume, the way that they speak with our students, the way that they introduce themselves, being relationship focused, talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs with an educator around what things need to be in place before we can educate. And so a lot of those things are just kind of in the fabric of what it means to develop a teacher and a staff member that joins our team. And then I guess lastly, I would say we really have partnered closely with the Da Vinci Schools Network, which is a school network really focused on project based learning, uh, enrichment, mastery based grading. And so for most most often, the youth and the populations that we serve are the ones that for whom that is not afforded. And so for many of them, they come from what, what I would call like a, a, a packet factory, um, where they're given a packet, they're asked to do it in their group home, they turn the packet in, that's a credit towards graduation, uh, versus the kind of really uh, involved and invested and, and rigorous uh, world that the project-based learning kind of model takes, where it's, we're going to look at real-life problems, 
real life uh, challenges that the world is facing. And then with that, your content areas can't really live in isolation. A lot of our kids think that math has nothing to do with English and English has nothing to do with social studies. That project-based learning model shows our students that actually to be really great at any of those things, you have to kind of have a overarching umbrella understanding of all of those things. And so, uh, really excited to be here, like Jeff said. Uh, really, really excited to spend this time with you all this morning. And that's uh, a little bit about RISE and the work we're doing. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, so I think uh, uh, Natalia Hernandez uh, has gotten held up. So we're going to move straight ahead. I'm going to have her introduce herself when she does get here. Uh, this is a tough time for schools right now. It's a very intense uh, time of year when there's a lot of board meetings and things. And she may not have been able to get out. Um, so the idea now is we're bringing together uh, Jeff, Erin, Natalia when she arrives, right, and all of you um, to think together with a couple of scientists who are doing work that's relevant to educational uh, outcomes and uh, well-being and brain development of teenagers, right, to start to think about how we might build a field in which the science that we as scientists do is most relevant to educators who are innovating in um, adolescent you know, secondary education spaces on the one hand, and on the other hand, where um, uh, educators are positioned to be able to leverage the science. So it's really a bi-directional conversation in which the scientists are um, doing work that's most relevant to educators and the educators are letting us know what we, you know, what they need from us, but also are able to engage with what um, we produce in a productive way. So, so that's kind of the aim. And I've asked the speakers to try, you know, to, for us to try to frame our work in that uh, frame. Um, and then we're gonna follow with a conversation um, in which, uh, uh, Jeff and Aaron and, and Natalia uh, engage with Solange and myself and, uh, and Eva around the science that we present um, and start to see what we can actually come to around the relevance and um, what seems surprising, what maybe you wish you did know, what seems problematic about the way we're doing things. Um, it's just a first, it's just a sort of a first bite of the apple, but, but hopefully a teaser for maybe a whole sort of subfield of MBE that could uh, that could grow up out of this. So I'm gonna, without further ado, pass it to Dr. Teltzer to introduce yourself and um, begin her talk. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'm looking forward to this experience to get to talk to the educators themselves and hear from you all about how we can best study and ask questions about adolescents. So I'm an associate professor of psychology and neuroscience at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. I study adolescent brain development, um, specifically taking a social and cultural context to that. So how our social environment and our culture shapes adolescence well-being and how the brain fits into this. So I will share my screen and begin. All right, can I get a nod that you can see my slides? Great. All right, so I'm gonna start with a quick thought experiment. And so what I want um, you to do is to conjure up what you imagine when you think of the typical adolescent. So what images come to mind? What are the behaviors or emotions you'd use to describe the typical adolescent? So just take a, a quick second to come up with that one word or phrase to describe adolescence. Now, when I ask this question to my class of undergrads at UNC, when I ask colleagues or friends, adolescents are most often characterized by negative behaviors. So they're often characterized as experimenting with drugs, using an excessive amount of alcohol, engaging in risky sex, reckless behaviors, Indeed, statistics such as morbidity and mortality rates increase 300% from childhood to adolescence contribute to these concerns and make adolescent risk taking a public health concern. But what's often overlooked is that the survival rate of US high school students and many other uh, countries, uh, especially in, in Europe, um, 
the survival rate is 99.9%. And most adolescents navigate the teenage years with very few of these problem behaviors. In fact, the most extreme risky behaviors are restricted to a small proportion of the population, but are often applied to describe adolescents as a whole. Now, when adolescents are characterized as a whole in this negative way, it leads to many negative stereotypes of what adolescents are typically like. So for instance, adolescents are described as rebellious, rude, insolent, disrespectful. Oops. And these stereotypes are often attributed to teens immature or even their broken brains, which are often portrayed in the media. As you can see here, there's regions of the brain dedicated to sex and emotions and angst. And this deficit perspective really suggests that adolescents are predisposed towards problem behaviors. It's driven by these biologically determined brain immaturities. And this really may constrain our ability to intervene. If it's an inevitable that teens are gonna be crazy and angsty and it's due to their brains, what can we do about it? So this view really emphasizes adolescent problem behaviors over more positive developments and behaviors. And now the biggest problem with this deficit perspective is that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So youth ideas about adolescents reflect what they see as normative during the adolescent period, which they may use as a standard for their own behavior. So for instance, if teens believe that adolescence is a time of heightened risk-taking, they might engage in more of that behavior. And so these negative expectations for adolescents based on these stereotypes it can exacerbate or even create problems that might not otherwise exist. So a previous grad student in my lab did a longitudinal study examining how these negative conceptions of adolescence relate to adolescents' risk-taking behaviors. And what we found is that adolescents who had more negative conceptions about adolescents showed these longitudinal increases in risk-taking behavior across two years. And this is even found at the neural level. So these negative conceptions of adolescence, so teens who think that adolescence is more of this negative developmental period, show these longitudinal changes in prefrontal cortex activation when engaging in cognitive control. And so these data suggest that these negative conceptions about adolescence during the teenage years are becoming self-fulfilling prophecies and are even substantiated in the developing brain. So a more accurate lens is describing adolescence as a time of both risks and opportunities. Although risk-taking increases in parallel, most adolescents develop social competence. They show rises in perspective taking and considering the needs of others. And so rather than contributing to problem behaviors, the developing brain is evolutionarily programmed to adapt and learn, to promote social connection and competence, to care and engage in other oriented behaviors. And this really sets the stage for lifelong flourishing. And this isn't to say that risk-taking behaviors don't characterize adolescents because they certainly do, but risk-taking behaviors themselves are also a more com complex phenomenon than just drugs and sex and rock and roll. Many risks can be very adaptive and positive and even pro-social. So for instance, a kid raising their hand in class or asking their crush out on a date can be a risk and scary for some teens, but potentially the outcome can be very rewarding too. Or risks, for example, to help another teen, which we've called pro-social risks, can be very positive, although they may come at the at, at, they may come at a risk to the self. So for instance, if a teen sees another student being bullied and stands up to that bully, this is considered a risk, but they're helping their peer at the cost of potentially being bullied themselves. So my lab seeks to examine how changes in the developing brain support both risks and opportunities in adolescents. So interestingly, the same neural systems that support risk-taking behaviors also support these pro-social other-oriented behaviors. So for instance, the ventral striatum, 
uh, area of the brain um, in the valuation system codes for reward values. So this area of the brain is activated when we feel good. And this area of the brain, the ventral striatum, tends to be activated when teens engage in risk-taking behaviors, and also when teens engage in pro-social, other-oriented behaviors. Now, while many assume that adolescents are going to develop risks or opportunities, these can occur in tandem, and their intersection may be what makes adolescents a particularly unique period. So the intersection of pro-social and risk-taking behavior really challenges the widely supported model of adolescence as a period of heightened vulnerability by suggesting that these traditionally negative behaviors like risk-taking could foster positive development if those risks are, are taken at the benefit uh, or are, are taken to benefit others. So this intersection um, right at the cusp of risk-taking and pro-social behaviors. So we've found, for example, that pro-social and rebellious behaviors are positively correlated within adolescence. So teens who show higher pro-social behavior tend to engage in more rebellious or risky behaviors. So this means that teens who tend to be more pro-social also tend to engage in more risk-taking. So this tells us that adolescents are not developing risk-taking or pro-social tendencies, but they develop both in tandem. And each of these risk-taking behaviors and pro-social tendencies are predicted by a similar behavioral trait, so fun-seeking. So this means that the tendency to seek out rewards and engage in fun activities can promote both risky behaviors, but also pro-social behaviors. So enhanced development of these neural systems involved in reward valuation, um, which drives these sensation-seeking behaviors, um, as well as brain development in other regions, such as those involved in social sensitivity, makes adolescents really well poised to take risks with the broader goals of helping others. And indeed, around the world, we can see examples of adolescents taking these risk-taking risk behaviors with the intention of being pro-social and other-oriented. So for example, um, uh, standing up against racism, climate change, and gun violence, teens are really um, motivated and well poised, and in my opinion, due to these changes in the brain to really stand up and make a difference in this world. So we've done um, several different studies in my lab. I won't go into the details of the methods or the results. I'll tell you just the big picture outcomes that we found, and I'm happy to go into more details with you, either in discussion or afterwards, about how we sort of examine the good and the bad of the adolescent period or the risks and the opportunities. So in one study, for example, when we do sort of directly pit different um, social contexts against each other, you may be surprised that the good uh, more often outweighs the bad. So for instance, we've shown that parents are more likely than peers to have an influence on adolescents' attitudes and behaviors with activations in um, the ventral striatum and other reward-related regions underlying this effect. In other words, parents' opinions and behaviors and attitudes tend to have a, a stronger weight on what adolescents do compared to their peers, which suggests that teens might actually value their parents' thoughts and ideals more than their peers, which certainly contradicts the widely held stereotype that adolescents value peers more than their parents. And when it comes to peer influence, so when peers are directly um, uh, trying to influence um, adolescents' attitudes, we find that teens are actually more likely to resist their peers than to be susceptible to their influence. Again, this is um, driven by neural activation in these reward-related regions. So adolescents are able to stand firm in their own attitudes, even when confronted with opposing attitudes by their peers. And finally, when they do conform, they do so selectively. So we found that peer influence more strongly occurs in these pro-social than antisocial contexts. 
For instance, adolescents are more likely to be influenced by their peers when it comes to behaviors like studying or helping others than behaviors like stealing or cheating. And again, this is supported by activation in these brain regions in, um, uh, involved in reward valuation, suggesting that it may be more motivating to um, conform to others when it is in a, a pro-social positive context. So these data really challenge many prevailing conceptions of adolescence as a time of excessive conformity to these more negative aspects of peer influence and suggest that teens are able to stand firm in their own attitudes, but when they do conform, they do so selectively and to more positive pro-social contexts. So my takeaway for you today is that teens are pretty remarkable. Our stereotypes of adolescents are all wrong. And that my call to action is to hope that some of this can help us to kind of spread the message to expose parents, teachers, and teens to more positive peer models, to help foster environments with more pro-social norms, and to focus on dispelling the stereotype that teens are spoiled, entitled, and risky, but instead are courageous and energetic and optimistic and really smart as this New York Times quote emphasizes. And I'll just end with a thank you for listening and I look forward to our further conversations. Fantastic, that was, that was absolutely fascinating. So um, we have uh, a couple of minutes now for some questions um, for Dr. Telzer about the, the work before we move into my talk. We have uh, one question in the chat, um, just about the sort of the onset of adolescence, perhaps merging earlier. Yeah, absolutely. If you try to define when adolescence starts and ends, it's pretty tricky because we can define it as starting with pubertal development, um, which historically has started to occur earlier and earlier. We could define it based on age. So the teenage years, for example, we could define it based on schooling. So in the US, the start of junior high school can be defined as the beginning of adolescence. Um, there's, there's many, many, many ways to define when adolescence starts, but certainly it's true that um, historically it's starting to emerge earlier and it's starting to end later. So the, the length of the adolescent years are longer than they've been in past generations. I have another question. I was just curious about the quality of the parent relationship. Is that the, the influence that the parent or the adult and the guardian in that person's life, does that make a difference of how much influence they have? Absolutely. So a lot of our work has looked at the quality of their relationships. Um, we've done some work looking at, for example, um, just when the mere presence of parents are um, in uh, virtually next to a peer while they're driving, um, th that teens are safer. However, if that is a low quality parent, that buffering effect, that positive effect of parents goes away. And so I don't wanna send the message that parents matter more and we need all parents to influence their kids more because you're absolutely right. If it's a negative relationship, it can actually do some damage. Great. Uh, it looks like someone is requesting um, the, your publication information. Are you on ResearchGate or what would be the best way? If you go to my website, I can pull it up real quick and put it in the chat. All of our publications there are open access so you can download them all. So I will throw this in the chat for you. And all these papers that I presented are published um, and linked on there. Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, that was fantastic. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna start sharing my screen to move into the next presentation. Um, okay.
Okay, so um, to build on what Dr. Uh, Dr. Telson was talking about, um, my talk looks at the ways that young people actually construct that meaning in a social space. So um, it really is a lovely compliment to what we just heard because it's looking at the individual differences across kids and how you might be able to identify those differences by talking to kids and by looking at the ways that they make meaning out of their lives. What do they tell about their lives? How do they claim to be experiencing their lives? that um, has implications for the way in which they grow and develop over time. And then in turn, um, what could we be doing in educational settings to try to support these beneficial uh, patterns of meaning making that we're seeing um, are growing kids in, in, in good directions over time. And so uh, the main sort of big idea here is that the emotions that teens have, just like we just heard, are, are the negativity of them, the positivity of them. What, what we're showing is really important is the way in which these emotions are felt. So in other words, the way in which a young person constructs a narrative around that emotion has um, important implications for the way in which they grow over time. So the kinds of stories that they tell themselves about how the world works, who they are in it, why things happen the way they do, how they could happen differently into the future, right? Those are the, those are the impetus for the kinds of pro-social and the kinds of antisocial behaviors that you see in teenagers, right? When you see, you know, Emma uh, uh, Gonzalez or these other amazing teenagers on, you know, uh, talking about the kinds of causes that they work for so hard in their lives, what they're basically doing in, in the way I think about it is constructing a really deep uh, cognitive abstract transcendent story that is also infused with strong emotion. And that that construction of a story is driving their behavior and their values and their beliefs. Um, so I'm just gonna show you a very quick uh, clip from a NOVA episode where we were featured just to give people a sense because of uh, how the experiments go. And this is of course not a real experiment that you're seeing. This is, um, this is uh, one of our great high school interns who was in the experiment who, um, who redid it for the purposes of um, TV, but it gives you a sense of kind of how we do this. We sit with teens and talk to them about the way they make sense of the world. And then we look at how their brains grow over time. And so I'll show you those data in a minute too. I had here in the interest of time. All right. Imordino Yang works with teens from troubled neighborhoods. We're gonna be watching stories. We really wanna know what you think. So there's no right or wrong answers. These are kids who see a lot of crime, they see a lot of dangerous things, they see a lot of poverty. And we wanted to understand how do they make meaning of that world around them. This first one is a story about a girl who lives in Savat, Pakistan. And the city was being taken over and basically run by a group called the Taliban. Um, so I want you to watch her when she was 12 years old. First, she gets them emotionally engaged in a topic by showing them videos about people struggling to overcome adversity. And I want to become, become a doctor. <laughs> so how does her story make you feel? Um, this story makes me feel upset how she wants to be a doctor and continue on with her education, but it makes her sad that knowing her journey would be very difficult. For adolescents, these types of stories can trigger moments of deep reflection. They come back from those kind of reflective moments with this heightened appreciation of the meaning of the story and what it applies to in their own life and what it means for the nature of the world more broadly. And it's crazy how it's that powerful. Whereas we've known that for a long time in education, the neural data are giving us new insights into the mechanics of that process. Over here. Okay, so what you saw was just a little clip of this young woman talking about her reaction to the story of Malala as a young teen in Pakistan, right? 
And she explains her answer to the question, how does this story make you feel, right? Which is meant to be ambiguously cognitive and affective and completely open-ended. And then we um, videotape those interviews, we analyze those interviews uh, for you know, behavior, for words, for affect, uh, for uh, prosody, for body language, for eye gaze, there's any number of things you can look at in there. And then we move the uh, teenager into the MRI scanner and she watches the same stories again and pushes buttons to tell us how she's feeling. Um, and we're measuring what's going on in her brain, we're measuring what's going on in her body using psychophysiological recording. Um, and so I want to take you back to uh, Isela's uh, really cogent um, kind of uh, feelings about the story of this young girl in Pakistan and, and take you beyond what the Nova episode showed, so to speak. And I, here I've kind of put together some data so you can see what it looks like. Um, she says, um, this story makes me feel upset. Oh, she wants to be a doctor, continue on with her education, but it makes her sad. Knowing her journey would be very difficult. And it's crazy how it's that powerful. But she goes on beyond that, which you don't hear. And she says, I mean, it, it makes me think about my own journey in education, how I want to go to college and hopefully be a scientist someday. And even more, I guess what really hits me is how not everyone's able to get this chance to go forward with their life, to get an education, do what they want to do with their life. I mean, it's, it's not right. Uh, I guess what I think more, yeah, it makes me feel upset that I'm, and she sort of stops to think, right? Others live in like certain parts of the world where they don't want people to learn and they're trying to hold them back. But then uh, her story like inspires me to like uh, work harder so that I can prevent those things from happening maybe. Everyone everywhere should have the chance. I mean, all human beings should be able to live free and choose their future. So when you look at this sort of uh, narrative that this young woman has created around this story, you can um, sort of pull out different ways in which she's making meaning. And so this work now is done very closely with my uh, former grad student, uh, Rebecca Gottlieb, where um, we went through and coded the data for what we call sort of concrete, direct, empathic responses to the story. So she says things like, this story makes me feel upset. How, and then she goes on and tells the details of the story. This is true, that's true, right? But then she goes beyond that. She kind of transcends that direct response to that story and instead starts to talk about things like it's powerful, right? Where the power is not directly in that story right there. It's in the meaning she's making of it about what it means for her own journey in education, her own life. And from there, she goes even beyond that to an even broader frame of reference where she starts talking about um, kind of what should generally be true in the world, what is true and right, what ought to be how the world is. And so what I want you to notice is that she's moved from this very kind of concrete, specific, empathic reaction to the story, which is totally appropriate, but then she also goes beyond that to move into these bigger frames of reference that are the source of her learning. And um, so Rebecca's also shown in this work that um, kids who show behaviors in the interview that they're making these broader meanings, right? Uh, actually uh, remember the stories better five years later, their eye gaze and things like that. Let us know that they're stopping to think. And when they do that, they remember these stories better. So this is also learning for those of you who are in education. And so I'm now gonna take you to the data uh, from 65 young people who we followed for uh, multiple years from age about 15, 16 up. They're now in their early 20s. We followed them the last time in 19, 20 years old. Um, and just show you kind of how individual differences and in how kids made sense out of those stories relate to the ways their brains activated when we put them in the scanner and asked them to watch the stories again and tell us how they were feeling. And then in turn predicted also their brain development over time and mediated, that means sort of statistically explain why uh, they're happier as young adults. Um, and so what you see here is a map of the places in the brain where in orange, yellow, there was more, more activation for young people who talked more concretely across the interview. 
Um, and blue to green was whether there was more activation for young people who talked more abstractly across the interview. And what's really important to notice is that concrete and abstract talk are uncorrelated. What that means is that a young person could do a lot of one, a lot of the other, a lot of both, a lot of neither, right? Every kid did at least some of each, but doing one doesn't mean you're not doing the other. And that's very, very critical for you to understand about these findings. Um, and the other really important thing about these findings is that there, the analyses are done controlling for IQ and the youth socioeconomic status and age. So um, these are all kids from low SES contexts, from uh, uh, urban uh, neighborhoods of Los Angeles with high levels of uh, criminal activity and things, but they're kids who were not engaged in any of that kind of activity. Um, their kids are kind of those, you know, 99% of good kids doing what they're supposed to be doing, who are doing fine. Um, and we're talking to them about how they make sense of what they see around themselves. Um, and so what we're showing is hopefully the effects of this kind of meaning making, even given a certain level of IQ or even given a certain socioeconomic status of their family, including their uh, income to needs ratio in the family and also their parents' education level. So there seems to be something really special about these, uh, especially the abstract kinds of talk for uh, growing young people over time. And of, of course, there's a century of research on abstraction and adolescence and the really important sort of um, role that it plays. So when Dr. Telzer asked at the beginning, what do you think of when you think of adolescence? I think of abstract thinking. I think of kids who transcend the context and just wanna like give meaning to everything. You know, these aren't just my shoes. These are like, you know, my position in the world and they, you know, tell you about what kind of music I like and what kind of hopes and dreams I have and how I think about adults. And, you know, there's so much kind of uh, infused social identity building and meaning infused into just simple things for adolescents. And they're, they're almost driven to do this. Um, so what you'll notice if you're a neuroscientist is that the red to orange regions basically correspond to what we call the executive control network. So this is a network of brain regions that are especially involved in kind of managing your behavior in the here and now, uh, regulating emotions, uh, focusing in task-oriented ways on, um, you know, pay, sort of paying attention in the traditional sense that educators mean it. You know, so kids who are engaging in these uh, more sort of direct empathic ways of understanding the story are also activating these sort of direct engagement with the world kind of regulatory regions. And I should say this also seems to have ecological validity. So kids who did this more also uh, reported having better relationships in their daily lives. They, uh, they had a more diverse group of friends. They are um, a sort of more em sort of empathically engaged with the people around them and they notice what's happening around them, which is a really uh, a great thing to do. Um, but what our data suggests is that it's not enough. Um, the kids who were talking in additionally more abstractly, right? The kids who were also making these broader meaning about like everyone everywhere should have the chance, right? When you notice that that's the case, what we get are activations in these blue to green regions, which basically correspond to what we call the brain's default mode network. And I've written a lot about what I think the default mode network sort of contributes to the story in education. But um, the, the bottom line idea here is that these are networks of the brain that are, in, that are sort of central hubs for constructing broader kind of uh, transcendent thinking that isn't in the real physical here and now. You need to kind of deactivate your kind of musculoskeletal arms and legs body. You need to kind of distance yourself from the immediate physical surroundings around you in order to be able to kind of go inward and kind of make sense of it all. You need to construct a story that isn't disrupted by things sort of interrupting you in the here and now. Um, and we actually have other uh, studies that show that people actually avert their gaze and um, close their posture and kind of look down and things like that to try to distance themselves from physical stimuli in the world in order to construct this inner mental world that we think is really instrumental in um, well-being and also uh, growing uh, kids' abilities to function well over time. So um, there's a lot of words here, but I put them for people who watch the talk later uh, just in recording. Um, so what we find also, and this work is uh, um, under uh, revision right now, it's being reviewed, that 
story by story, when a young person makes abstract meaning, we can predict that they're gonna activate these regions of their brain in very concerted patterns that, um, that are actually strengthened when they're experiencing strong emotion by their own report at that moment. And so what we think this means is that emotion in the context of abstract thinking, the kind of thinking that becomes sort of deeply pro-social and transcendent, where you're wondering about what does this mean for me and for the world, not just, oh, poor girl right here, right now, um, that may drive the kinds of deeper meaning making that we find are really important for young people's growth and development over time. So this is kind of like a deep dive into the kinds of pro-social meaning making um, that Dr. Telzer was talking about last before me. And, and interestingly, we found no evidence of this for concrete thinking. Experiencing a lot of emotion at the same time as you're saying, oh, I feel so bad for that poor girl. That's so wrong. Like, that's terrible. That doesn't help you um, sort of organize your mind or brain into a sort of concerted state that we can predict will grow you over time. It's only when you're building this transcendent meaning and feel really strongly about those ideas that we see this effect. And what we also find, and I'll show you a little bit more about this, is that adolescents' propensities to talk abstractly uh, in the interview. So just the degree to which they were inclined to do this over a two hour interview with 40 stories in there predicts their brain development two years later. Interestingly, in the, the sort of connectivity, the ways that these two different networks, the executive control and the default mode are organized to talk to each other. So in other words, these two networks are developing into a more organized um, strong relationship with each other so that they can trade off more effectively so that they can uh, leverage each other, each other's activation potentially and to sort of uh, suit the moment to adapt the young person's thinking and feeling in order to make the kind of meaning that would be useful in that moment. That kind of regulated affect and cognition um, seems to be associated with the development of these two networks uh, kind of talking to each other. And um, so this is a gigantic, uh, basically statistical model, but I'll talk you through it, um, where uh, we basically show at the left-hand side of the slide at around age 15 to 16, that uh, when young people are inclined to talk abstractly like this, we're seeing the concerted activity of these two networks. So we see more activity in the default mode but we also see um, executive control network activity early, early in the trials, they first see the story. And that kind of ramps the whole thing up, kind of um, regulates them into a place where they can transcend and think in a systematic uh, effortful way about the bigger, deeper meaning. Um, and then the degree to which they do that does not talk like this, does not pre directly predict uh, when they're 19 years old, right? What we call their identity development. Um, but it does indirectly predict it via the ways that these brain networks grow. So in other words, you need to show us that you're growing your brain in these ways, and then that you're showing us that you're really doing the work. And that over time by young adulthood is predicting all kinds of good things and negatively predicting all kinds of bad things. So you have better relationships, better academic performance, you like yourself more, all that kind of stuff uh, when you're engaging in this kind of brain development over time. So just to sum up, uh, the ways kids are talking to us about the way they think and feel about the world is actually appearing to be a kind of force in their own development that is growing their brains and their minds over time in a social context in ways that are helpful to them, potentially. Thanks. Thank you so much. That, there's so much there. I think uh, to kind of summarize together what I'm seeing in the chat and the questions is like, I think people immediately are going to, I moved by the strengthened by their own report, like giving them the space to be able to do that really helps them with that integrated thinking. And yeah. I see the educators' minds churning there and saying, hey, I, we call that this, and, and this is the way we're doing that. And I think that the panel discussion is, is gonna be lively in how to integrate that idea. I like mm -hmm. that a lot. All right, should we um, move to Dr. Dinerville?
Ah, yeah, now it's working well. Thank you. So I will share my screen. Okay, can, can you see? Can you see the screen well? Yeah. So I'm going to share some results we had about uh, Montessori education. And in fact, these, you have to note that these um, studies were run in younger children. It's like just from five to 13 years old. So it's maybe early adolescence, what we have at the end. But anyhow, it gives us insights about early stages of development and how maybe we come up with some adolescence. So I will talk about like some of a very important process we do have in life that is error monitoring. So error monitoring is something we are all equipped with that make us adapt and adjust to an unexpected event in life. So I just give you an example. Imagine it's a sunny day and you're in Switzerland, so you have Swiss Alps, so you decide to go for a hike. Maybe this is how you picture your day. However, we all know that life is not a steady flow and we always face something that is unexpected. So what happens when we face something unexpected? We need to detect, to eva evaluate this unexpected event, and then we can adapt and adjust our behavior. So as you know, in adult, it's mainly autom automatic. We don't think about it. We just react in a way. And sometimes we are, we are even able to adapt in a quite creative way. However, in children, it is not automatized yet. So one of these loop is quite developing in children. And here you will observe a young toddler and you will see how she is reacting and how she's observing something unexpected. And you know, young toddler, toddlers are great because they go much slower than us and they cannot hide reaction. So it's an open window on this error monitoring process and look at her when she discover herself. This is quite unexpected. So she repeats the experience. She's integrating all this feedback to update her internal model. And hopefully one day she won't be surprised. Or maybe if she goes to the hairdresser that sometimes happens to us as well. So this is exactly the process of error monitoring. We detect that something is not um, has not gone the way we were expecting, which is an error, a surprise signal for the brain. And the brain, in fact, is equipped with a structure that detects, detects any surprising event. And what we have found is that between around 6 to 12 years of age, children, they, they have big changes within that structure. So, it, it might be that they are constructing, constructing and wiring their brain to react and self-regulate themselves when they face unexpected, uh, unexpected events such as errors. And you know, during these years, children spend a lot of time at school. So the main question of my PhD work was maybe the way children experience unexpected events at school such as errors, my impact, how they will react. And we, we just observed and measured error monitoring in traditionally schooled children versus Montessori school children. And we just took measure in how they were able to detect, to self-correct and how they were evaluating the errors and maybe finally how they would adapt to these errors. These studies were done in Switzerland in very high socioeconomic environment and traditional schooling in Switzerland is very homogenized, meaning that it's really frontal teaching, they are great, and we do not have any, a lot of variation between classes. So it was kind of a setting to observe two different ways to tackle errors and how they would shape 
behavior and brain. What we found using more than 230 children who some of them did all the behavioral measures, others had neuroimaging uh, in addition, such, such as EEG and as well um, MRI scanning. And I will just show you the main results. Is that traditionally schooled children, they start detecting errors around six years old, and they seem to be surprised when they do a mistake across development. And they are not very good at improving in self-correction. However, Montessori school children, they can detect error from a very young age on, and they learn to self-correct across development, and they don't seem to be so surprised when they do a mistake, when they are older. It's like they would acknowledge that something is not okay, and they would just face it. And you know that 99% of the adults are afraid of being wrong? And it's even worse, we don't like being wrong. We have a very strong affective reaction when we are not correct. And you can see here my colleague, she's doing a game. That was the experiment. And you can see that each time she's wrong, you can see this automatic reaction, very negatively biased. We measured that in children. And, and unsurprisingly, young children, they don't show any of these negative effects when they are wrong. However, they have a very positive effect toward correct action. Furthermore, what we observed is that Montessori school children, they have no effect related to their actions, meaning that being correct or incorrect for them is neither good or bad. They just stick to the fact. It's just an information they take, take along to go and pursue the process until they reach the correct response. And this is what you can see here on this graph. There are, they have no bias toward positive or negative reaction. However, the bias you can observe in traditionally school students, they have a very strong association. Whenever they are correct, they feel it's very positive, meaning that they associate strongly the fact of being correct and that is something good. You might think this is what we want. And it took me a while to think a bit more about that and realizing that if you have a strong association in your behavior and that you have tightly associated that being correct is very good, the reverse and the symmetry of that is just that being wrong is bad. And this is what we observe in most adults. So it means that if the brain is plastic for this information and this feedback, and the children start association, associating like value with where their action, they don't rely on themselves anymore. They will re re rely on others' a judgment. Plus, it's not factual information anymore. It has some value on it. So then when we look at the neural data, there is one important result is that the way these children learn differ. So the way they will use correct versus incorrect responses differ in how they wire their brain. What we found is that traditionally schooled students they will mainly wire and connect their brain to memorize correct responses. Whereas Montessori school students, they start wiring and connecting their brain to solve problem whenever they did something wrong, which gives some information about the mindset they might develop across development, being more process versus outcome oriented. Because if you just, if you have learned on a daily basis that you just need to memorize the correct answer for to have a good grade or to success to be successful at a test then you might just learn that there are correct responses in real life but in fact real life you never know the correct response you need to go and it's a process so you might think that they have stronger executive abilities 
in Montessori environments. However, we couldn't find any differences in executive functions. Way more interestingly, we found that Montessori students very robustly show higher creative thinking abilities, meaning that the way they are, they are trained and they learn to face unexpected events might be tightly re related to the way they are able to innovate and create unexpected events themselves. So in fact, it was also consistent with the brain activity, the brain dynamic they have, which is way more diverse and stable at the same time. Meaning that the metastability, the way they can use and recruit different brain regions across time is much higher in Montessori school students. So they seem to have a flexible adjustment in life and they are ready to face real life. They have access to their own creative potential and critical thinking, which is maybe autonomy. And this is maybe what we target in children to rely on themselves, to be able to meet others and co-create later. So this is the last experiment I will show you when we measure the capacity to think by themselves in these Montessori students. We robustly observe they have a lower tendency for over imitation, meaning a lower tendency to do what they observe, even if it's useless. For that, it's the hook task. We ask the child to get a reward within that bottle. They don't succeed most of the time. So we show them a video, a short video clip with an adult showing how to do a hook and also a useless action. And what we observe is that very significantly, Montessori school children, even very, from a very young age on, they will not over imitate. They will just stick to the hook side but they will not add this useless action, which is also a sign of the capacity to think by themselves and stick to the goal. So the next question for us as may, are maybe when they reach the adolescent and teenage years, these children that have developed this core competence to think by themselves and to rely on themselves on this intrinsic motivation, maybe they are more ready to meet others and to cooperate at an age that then suddenly the social group starts being so important. So the take home message is that we, we, I mean, we face so many different challenges being at the climate, societal, professional um, levels. So skills such as independent thinking and cognitive flexibility will be highly required. So it seems that there is something in the Montessori education that allows the brain to mature and to acquire these competencies across development. But how and what aspects from the Montessori education make this development possible is not yet understood. We do not know whether it's because they are able to, there is a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning, whether it's the fact that they don't have great praise or reward, whether it's because they have self-corrective material or long and uninterrupted working hours, whether they rely on self-directed activities. And all these questions are very highly open and need to be understood also to scale up and to open these um, findings and outcomes in many different children. So I'm very happy to have also your feedback and experience about that in different type of schooling. Thank you. That was fascinating, uh, Dr. De Nerville. Um, so uh, we have time for uh, one or two uh, questions. Are there no questions? Uh, okay, so we're gonna move straight into the panel and then we'll bring the questions together at the end. So I'm gonna invite uh, first uh, Natalia Hernandez to introduce herself um, because she was held up in the uh, in a school related uh, activity early in the meeting, um, and then uh, 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 I'm going to ask uh, uh, Jeff Garrett and uh, Aaron Whalen and uh, 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 Natalia Hernandez to um, 
uh, give their perspectives, comments, thoughts, questions, and engage with uh, Solange and Yvette and myself around the science. So please go. Thank you, Mary Helen. Hi, everyone. My name is Natalia Hernandez. I am the head of school at Breck School in the Twin Cities. Breck is a preschool through 12th grade co-ed uh, independent day school. Um, we are uh, so independent schools under the umbrella of private schools. Uh, at Breck, we um, we graduate about 120 students in our senior class. So our total enrollment is about 1,160 students, roughly. Uh, we say that we graduate students prepared for a life of intellectual curiosity, self-knowledge, and social responsibility, those three things. And I kind of want to focus a little bit in terms of introduction of myself and our school and why I'm here on the self-knowledge piece. Breck has the Peter Clark Center for Mind, Brain, and Education that serves to bridge research and practice uh, for teachers, quite frankly. We do a lot of parent education also, but really trying to create the kinds of contextual experiences, really curating an academic program that leads to exactly what we've just been listening to, all of these things, that, that the results, the, the findings from these research um, studies that have been done are actually put into practice in schools and vice versa. The researchers can see what actually works in schools and that there can be that bridge that is constant so that students graduate really prepared for you know a lifetime um, engagement around learning that they are confident learners for life. So I'm really honored to be here because I, I, as a school administrator, I apologize for being late. Mary Helen's absolutely right. There's just so little that we can actually control, but we do have this sense that we can, we can create experiences for children that will end up with experiences that are much more pro-social and, and sort of self-actualized um, as, as they go on to their lives. Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to invite uh, uh, Jeff and Aaron um, and Natalia uh, to uh, to jump in. Looks like Aaron, you're ready to say something. <laughs> yeah, <it's so, laughs> such ahead. an amazing, such an amazing conversation and so much exciting research. Um, just in the position of of working in education, I'm just so I feel empowered by this data because it allows some um, really just strong metrics and measures to be built behind kind of what we've always felt in the school. So I know for me, some things that I'm kind of thinking about are going on in my head is this concept of abstract thinking and reflection and how integral that can be to the developing brain, I think just inconsistently, and then how that could interface with the research around error monitoring. Um, and then of course, I think Juanita who was in the chat talked about like the, the tr how trauma could impact potentially maybe this ability to error monitor or could impact a uh, use ability to error monitor. And so my thinking is, in traditional systems, historic systems of schooling, we often, when a student makes an error that is of considered to be a danger to the community or considered to be a breach, we push them out, right? We expel them, we suspend them, we, we actually limit any ability that they have to reflect, which seems to be what grows the mind. And we often push them out of the schoolhouse where they made that mistake, which would be the quickest connection, like the quickest connection to fixing the mistake or to processing healthily to fix the mistake in the future instances. And so I think about how this data in itself, all these different metrics could really make us rethink how many traditional schools deal with students who are going through behavioral challenges. Because if we are taking away the resources, taking away that stimulus uh, of the environment and now asking them to now be pushed out, um, it, it could ultimately impact their ability to, to learn. And of course, this disproportionately happens to youth who have been through trauma because they often have a much more challenging time doing that error monitoring in the way that, that is deemed appropriate by schools. And then of course, those systems are also disproportionately impacted youth of color, which is just the school to prison pipeline in the end of the day. So I think like, how do we use this research to really talk about how we heal our students for, for really like a healthy, future versus pushing them out so that other kids can learn, which is always what we say, right? We're pushing them out, but in the end of the day, it's in our job to teach those youth how to, how to best react um, and, and be in a better place to, to actively function in society. So lots of different ideas, but those are some of the things that come to mind. That's fantastic. Yeah, I think, and I think uh, the question about trauma from Juanita and uh, you're picking up on that, Erin, is really a key one. It's one that we're starting to, to look at um, to understand because these same brain systems that are involved in error monitoring, that little response, right, is basically when, when you get traumatized, it's on, on steroids, right? You get, you know, really exaggerated, um, you know, uh, error monitoring response in, in effect. So how does that actually shape the learning process in a way that uh, educators need to accommodate? Um, 
Jeff, do you want to do you want to jump in? Yeah, so I, I think I'm thinking about something uh, that's a bit of an extension of what Aaron uh, was raising, and specifically with regard to um, Eva's uh, presentation. My, you know, my, uh, I was left thinking about the <laughs> the very um, precarious position we may be in with a society that has well-developed negative conceptions of adolescence, and you're finding that. Uh, we sort of speak those things or think those things into existence in terms of long-term outcomes for for young people um, and the the cementing of those conceptions in their own minds. Um, so you've given me a lot just to reflect on uh, in terms of um, some of the narrative we we perpetuate within K to twelve education generally as well. But also, I'm wondering about how your findings may interact with uh, kind of systems of oppression in our society, right? And the, um, for adolescents who are both experiencing the kind of standard set of negative assumptions about uh, what it means to be an adolescent and what they're sort of predestined to embody as an adolescent, layering upon that, um, you know, the, the experiences that uh, black and brown youth have that, uh, you know, the law enforcement system as it interacts with them, you know, creates that uh, LGBTQ youth uh, experience as well and other other groups who are, um, you know, experiencing uh, kind of an intersectional set of, uh, of some of those negative conceptions. I'm wondering, um, Eva, if you might, uh, if your research delved into that at all, or um, perhaps if, if you might be able to offer any additional insights about that? Yeah, that's a great question and something that's so important and so relevant right now. And um, we've, my lab does a lot of work to look at differences across cultural groups, race, ethnic groups, socioeconomic groups. Um, one study that's slightly relevant to the comment that you're um, asking about in a slightly different direction um, uh, we did a cross-national study in China and the U.S. And so um, conceptions of adolescence in China are very different than they are in the United States, where adolescence is not necessarily described as a time of risk-taking. Um, it's described more as a time of family responsibility um, and other aspects of um, slightly more positive um, framings of adolescence. And so um, I think it, it really highlights that that um, these different cultural contexts can shape our conceptions of adolescence. Um, and then trajectory-wise, adolescents in, um, in China who had these more positive conceptions of adolescence longitudinally did better in school, um, engaged in less risk-taking, engaged in more kind of family-oriented behaviors. Um, so just kind of taking that to the context of marginalized adolescents in the US, we can imagine that there's probably different conceptions of what adolescence means when you're from different groups for whom there's um, multiple forms of stereotypes. Um, um, and probably these either become self-fulfilling prophecies or teens are not treated either by society, their teachers, the police force, et cetera, in ways that allow them to thrive based on how we know they're developmentally um, ready to contribute to society and contribute to their own development and are pushing them in a way towards these more negative trajectories. Um, I'm reminded of some work. Um, it's like a memory far in the back of my brain, so I'm not going to get the details right, but when um, the, the main message that I'm remembering is if teachers on the first day are told that student A is going to excel and student B is not going to excel, student A ends up excelling more than student B just based on how teachers end up treating them and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy there. And so I can imagine um, if, if the educational system is biased based on race-based or gender-based or other marginalized um, stereotypes, it's going to impact students' success in the school system as well. So 
So if it's okay if I yeah. just jump in, yeah, because go ahead. Um, Dr. Telzer, everything you're saying is sort of consolidating my questions and observations after listening to everything. The first thing I'll say is how wonderful, how optimistic all these all these research findings are. I Someone said this earlier, like it's great to see the things that we all thought about adolescents sort of born out in some of these findings. Um, but one of the things I think about, we say a lot at the Peter Clark Center um, for Mind Brain Education that, you know, that that neuroplasticity is real, that success and challenge is temporary and it's contextual, right? You, you may be great uh, you know, in your calculus class, but then in, on the football field, it's gonna be a different context and, and your success and your challenges are different and, and, and all that's true. Um, so bear with me here because I have two streams sort of merging at once um, and it involves your study as well, uh, Dr. Denervo. Um, so, you know, if we're creating the context for students to, to truly internalize that, right? That neuroplasticity is real and success and challenge is temporary. Um, but we have teachers who have pedagogical automaticity based on how they were taught and have their own reactions and responses to error um, and their own errors. And how do, how do, you, how do we interrupt that, um, that replication uh, just in terms of how teachers teach in that context, because teachers have the closest lever to the student experience um, is one thing. So, so to take that a step further, I think of Dr. Denevo, Denevo's work, and I think, you know, Breck's not going to become a Montessori school. And, and I know that practitioners listen and see that and, and, and take themselves out of that um, ability to analyze that work, because they see that and they say, we're not a Montessori school. And I think for me, the exciting thing about this panel is what are the things about how Montessori does education that interrupts that error messaging and how we interpret that, that we all as practitioners could then curate our experiences to match that. And so I would love to know more about sort of that concrete ability to move forward. Yeah, and I jump in just to, to say, that's a very good point. What you said is like, it's not related to Montessori only it's related to how we understand the new the biology of the child and how the child develops and his characteristic and how we can respond to this characteristic if every teacher can hear that from 6 to 12 children are highly super sensitive to the feedback they receive when they do an error and they can just train themselves not to add judgment or value to their feedback, but keep it as factual as possible. And this is some very simple changes we can make. But this, this is related to something else that you mentioned, and I think it's very important, is that most adults have themselves received a traditional education, and we are ourselves very biased in the way we perceive error and the way we are like equipped and trained to face unexpected events. We are not trained to face unexpected events. And teenager, the main, one of the issue we have with teenager is that they differ from us and we are afraid of difference. So we, we think we need to fix them because that's how we have been trained. We need to fix problem. We, but if we are just acknowledging that we need to access our own creativity to go through that process, then we maybe can meet adolescents and meet their reality. And I think this is also, this, these studies about error monitoring should inform us who we are as adults and where are our biases and maybe work on that will also give us some ideas and some creative insights about how we can change. Something I'm really curious about just in all of this work is if there's any correlation between error monitoring and how you process that and how you internalize uh, a lot of things, internalize success, potential, uh, your ability to actually do the thing that you're working on, whether you're good enough, right? Then there's like the, the that failure kind of complex that's opposite of growth mindset. I wonder if there's a correlation between how we process that and kind of some of the monetary kind of Montessori uh, pillars and folks who are more or less likely to actually master content 
or folks who are more or less likely to actually obtain uh, expertise in, a, in that area. I find that the youth that we serve at RISE, because of their many challenges in their life, they're very quick to give up. Um, because they've failed once and that is enough because they have enough voices in their head to not actually want to do it again. And then that impacts their ability to ever become excellent readers or excellent mathematicians or excellent at these different uh, categories. And so I wonder how we can, of course, switch that that narrative, use, use this study to switch that and then of course entitle, you know, have that growth mindset. But I imagine there's really strong correlations between youth who have been through some of these challenges and their ability to even healthily process the error monitoring uh, piece, because uh, it's so far away from being neutral and so many kids have been, uh, to Jeff's point, right, with even with positive intentions of incentives, have we put so much uh, emphasis on you get this because you did well on this, they're not, they're no longer able to have a neutral negative response or a neutral, neutral response to not having it right. And so I wonder how there's a, there is that reverse relationship that might occur. Aaron, that's exactly what I was thinking. And I was going to like read out loud Jeffrey's comment that he put in the chat because I, you know, it was interesting with the video with the adult who was doing the quiz on the, on the computer. And you could see that when she, she got it wrong, she kind of went like this, you know, I just kept waiting for her to get it right and go like this. Yeah, because that's what we do. Like the, the rightness. And so in my community, this super high achieving, you know, rewards are everything it's almost like it's that it's almost like feeding an addiction right and so every, all of our systems all of the awards assembly at the end of the year and the teacher recognition like how or feedback how do we how do we shift culture so that it's more in line with the findings of these research studies that we know create a better context for learning yeah I'm, you're both making me think about and i'm sorry i can't um give credit to the various authors I've um, heard this from in recent years, but there are certain arenas in which even, you know, even in a traditional school setting, uh, even in, you know, in, in this context, where we do see students uh, ex uh, experiencing more of the, the type of um, error monitoring response that um, Solange was talking about, uh, and I know one of those areas that's often cited is video games, right? Where kids can fail over and over and over again and not be demoralized by the um, the experience of failure or not internalize the feeling that, you know, I'm never going to be successful at this or the fact that I'm being unsuccessful in this moment must mean something permanent about my ability to, you know, to ever learn new things, right? Um, you just start over and and play again and try a different strategy or that sort of thing so uh it does make me think about you know what we might learn from the spaces in our in our society where adolescents often tend to congregate um that uh that produce a different set of responses for them um and what that might have to do with why they enjoy being <laughs> in those spaces so much um i if i may i also wanted to switch gears a little bit um, and ask you a question, Mary Helen. Um, I know for particularly for history teachers right now, um, nationally, we're in a bit of a uh, precarious place with um, over 20 states across the country uh, passing or attempting to pass legislation to suppress the teaching of and exploration of, um, you know, any critical analysis of historical oppression or race or um, any of those sorts of issues and the sort of invented boogeyman of critical race theory uh, dominating a lot of headlines right now. Um, and as you were talking and, and as we were watching the video, you know, it made me think that there are places around the country where the exercise that you went through with that young person could be construed as uh, illegal at this point, right? Like asking young people to think critically about things that are happening in the world that have strong moral implications or, um, you know, that are about addressing injustice or that sort of thing. Um, and one, I guess, it, it, hearing your presentation was making me feel a little bit of uh, relief that there may be a good neuroscience argument to be made that um, actually these kinds of laws are, are doing developmental harm to young people on top of the fact that they're, you know, advancing a white supremacist mythology about the history of this country. But um, I'm wondering if you might be able to uh, share any thoughts or reflections on, on that connection to what we're seeing happen around the country right now with regard to the sort of curriculum wars. 
You know, that's a really great um, um, uh, thought, Jeff, that, you know, potentially we could argue. I mean, that, you know, it's, it's hard to argue for the opposite scientifically of what you found that the positive, that we're denying them the opportunity to do the thing that, um, that we found positive. But, but the thing that I think educators need to understand, uh, you know, policymaker people need to understand is that kids are gonna do this one way or the other, but the, the content of those narratives and the, their, the ways that those narratives get sort of bounced off of adults and shaped and encouraged uh, over time and elaborated over time um, is, uh, is, is uh, uh, really where parenting slash teaching of adolescence is doing its hardest work. I mean, that is the really hard work of, of teaching is to help kids building these internal narratives that then set them up to do the kind of error monitoring that Solange was talking about, to overcome the kinds of traumas that Aaron was talking about, right? And to be able to, um, you know, overcome the overwhelmingly strong urge to produce uh, in a sort of traditionally construed high achieving way that Natalia was talking about, which also undermines these things, right? High levels of success in our system is actually bad for kids in that sense, because it's cutting off their ability potentially to really think complexly about complex information. I mean, I, I mean, of course, I agree with everything wholeheartedly about the, the ridiculousness of making, you know, this kind of content illegal in schools on so many levels. It's, it's, it's problematic, you know, across multiple levels. But I, but I do want to focus here, given the content of the symposium on, um, you know, that really cogent idea that potentially we could use that we could, we could actually claim that we are denying young people the supported opportunity to um, engage in the patterns of cognition, like let's just call it that, that, uh, that actually develop their brain over time. And so if that were the case, um, then, then, then we, they could claim that we're, um, that we're harming them um, or failing to help them. That would, be, that would be an interesting take on it. What other people think? I'd be interested to know what others think. Well, I, don't, I mean, I don't want to take us too far off track, but I think that related to all of this is, you know, especially in the in the findings as I was listening to it and the sort of the next step for our Peter Clark Center that we're looking at is what is the role of identity formation in this when we talk about self-knowledge right. to know right. yourself as a learner. If it is contextual, what is the context that I'm coming into? Do I have right. to be overprotective of my identity as a Latina as I walk into you right. know, a board meeting considering what that looks like? Do, do my right. kid, do the kids at school of you know, in marginalized populations, do have to do that kind of protection that would limit their learning. You so you have I think to that's, do what's yeah. adaptive for you. Yeah, yeah, and the, I mean, I think what I would say, just connect it back before we take one or two questions from the broader audience, is is that's exactly the question that you know this stuff does not um, does not compartmentalize very nicely into different regions. These are the same regions of the brain that are involved in all kinds of thinking, and when you move yourself between different contexts you're bringing those dispositions of mind and heart with you. And um, yes, you develop skills that are context dependent, right? Or you're shaping your identity for a board meeting differently than you're sort of situating or positioning yourself when you're with your say grandma, right? It's different, but, um, but as a young person, you're relatively less skilled at moving yourself across those contexts and you're struggling with exactly reconciling those various identities with each other. And we know that the reconciliation of your various, you know, multifaceted identities in adolescence is a really important predictor of young adult well-being. So I think all of these things are kind of converging onto a story around a very deeply developmental story around the role of schooling in young people that we really need to step beyond thinking about what kids are learning, quote unquote, in the terms, in terms of you know, what they can do and perform as when we give them cues. Those are important things, but those are not the core of what schooling is actually about. What schooling is actually about is developing propensities and dispositions and skills for engaging in this complex multifaceted cognition that allows you to transcend context and be inclined toward making the kinds of strategic meaning that are gonna help move you forward, whether it's about your uh, error in math class or your correct grade in something else or your, um, or your uh, Latina identity, 
right? Or the trauma that you've had. It's really about sort of solving the Frankenstein problem as my colleague David Daniel talks about it and, and integrating in schooling that enables young people to integrate themselves into a coherent whole where they're not a little monster stitched with all these different learning science mechanisms together. They're actually a person in the middle who's agentically constructing a story around what's happening, no matter what it is. And I think that much of the power of an approach, like for example, Aaron's is, is lies in the, the deep support of that. And, and, um, and I can see that that's what a school like yours is also striving for. Um, we just have uh, a, a couple of minutes left. If there is a question from the, from the audience that someone would like to ask. Uh, Jane, oh, Jane, I haven't seen you in so long. Wow, okay. Um, asked to unmute. I asked you to unmute, Jane. Thank you. There you go. Um, I just wanted to put out that I'm looking at all the chats and there's some really powerful remarks that I'm being, but you know, adolescence has become very sexy and the, given lots of funding in the last, you know, 10 years or so. And I just want to remind us all that kids um, don't just sort of pop into puberty. And not every, you know, the other thing that we've been looking at, I think Erin, you highlighted among others is this whole issue of uh, adverse experiences and trauma. But just picking up something on Ava said that I, I think is really important is, it isn't just cultural differences like, are you in China versus Kenya versus the US? Um, but it's also that kids are getting messages about who they are and how they're allowed to think almost from the beginning that moms does or doesn't react to them in a responsive care mode. And different cultures have very different attitudes to whether small children are allowed to explore with words anyway. I mean, most kids are allowed to walk around and explore their, their environment but there's these huge messages that are, um, you know, all over the place that shape kids. And recently I did a very simple minded, somebody else did it first, but they pointed out that in the first three years of life, if you multiply 364, 65 days versus, you know, so many hours, so many minutes and so many, whatever, there are like 10 million opportunities to learn anything in the first three years of life. Right, assuming you're sleeping, they're actually 20 million. But, and, and that immediately hit me and said, wait a minute, even the smallest little messages about how you are supposed to behave in your culture or in your family are going to be really driven in. And so someone like Natalia, Natalia, I would think you might be in a great position because I think we do need to change society, but I think we need to give we need to address the intergenerational messaging that's going on. And so the parent-teacher association models might need to be reviewed. How do you reshape how mom is talking to baby? I work at the very early end. And of course, one of the issues has been, how do you encourage responsive care and get young people to talk to their babies and things like this, but it's, it's just, you know, by the time you've got to adolescence, you've learned so many things, right? That you then have to go into this new ex exciting experience with. And just as a highlight, just as a separate issue very quickly, Mary Helen, I was really taken by the example of your, your, your lady, your young lady. Yeah. And one of the things that I think is miserable in our culture here in the United States is how badly we do in teaching children labels for emotion. Yeah. And so this poor girl says, sad and upset. Those are the two things you've got a child in agony in front of you, you know, et cetera. And all she has to talk it is sad and upset. And we don't teach our small kids labels for all these physiological cues to our feeling tone ever. So they don't know how to talk it back at us and explain and what have you. Anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> yeah, so well, thank, you, thank you very much, Dr. Bernstein. I haven't seen you, I think, since like my dissertation defense. <laughs> this is a wonderful surprise. Um, well, thank you, everyone. We're out of time. This was an incredibly interesting conversation. Um, and I really uh, appreciate you all so much. Thank you very, very much to the speakers and panelists. Um, and. 
Uh, I have the sense we could go on all day and it would continue to be as interesting. So please remember to sign up for the um, upcoming IMBIS uh, uh, you know, series of symposia that are being sponsored. And, um, and please join the organization if you aren't a member and, and come to our conference in person next year. Uh, and thank you all, thank you all very much. I really appreciate all the hard work that you do. And again, thank you to the speakers and, uh, and thank you, goodbye.